Welcome to the Noya Caribbean podcast. This podcast is dedicated to bringing to life Caribbean history and culture from our Indo-Caribbean experience, the lives of our indigenous people, the Arawak, Kalinago, Taino, and more, our African heritage, and of course, our gangster stories of resistance and rebellion in the Caribbean, throwing in the history of our music, food, and cultural practices. The more we know our history, the more we know ourselves. So get to know yourself through Know Your Caribbean, the Know Your Caribbean podcast. Welcome, folks. Welcome, welcome, welcome to this episode of the Know Your Caribbean podcast. Thank you guys so much for listening. Big up our Patreon posse. Our Patreon family gets even more podcast episodes that's not released to the general public on top of all kinds of other perks and presents. Um, And you can join us on our Patreon at patreon.com forward slash New York Caribbean. Join us. Anyway, so we are jumping into this episode, which I'm very, very, very excited about. Um, There have been so many discussions about Carnival. And if any of you guys have spent anything more than five minutes on the page, you'll know how much I love Carnival very passionate about preserving the heritage of what carnival means. So I've dug up four very distinct stories of carnival from the late 1800s to the early 1900s, the latest one being from 1909. And it's coming from four different Caribbean countries. So we're going to be covering Dominica, Martinique, Puerto Rico, and Cuba. So four very different carnivals. Mind you, there are some synergies. And it's just amazing to see that we have continued this legacy. And, you know, it's all about encouraging cultural preservation. And this is why New Caribbean exists. So we're going to jump right in. So I found this excerpt, which was written in 1909 about Dominica Carnival, published in the Frank Leslie's Weekly in September 2nd, 1909. And the title of the article is When It Rains Flowers and Confetti in the West Indies. And the excerpt goes like this. The spirit of carnival is never quite dead in the West Indies. Just the introductory line alone. Okay, people need to recognize these things. I think, you know, the frustration about how carnival is just a seasonal thing. It's just a thing that we do for two days in a year and that's it. The fact that this was written in 1909. Okay, this is like 113 years ago. It says, the spirit of carnival is never quite dead in the West Indies. True, it only comes once a year, but during its short stay, it makes such an impression that it is always uppermost, either in pleasurable recollection or keen anticipation. There is only one thing more important, and that is a Christie procession. And it is doubtful which the laughter-loving natives would choose if they were to put on the test of choosing one of them. The passion of dancing and music is never dormant in the heart of the West Indian, who, after all, is very little different from his African ancestors, despite the English influence which seeks to modernize him. Now, as we all know, when you're reading all of these things, it's written by um, white folks, with their own perceptions. But like I say, we don't have much choice because there's very little writing by black writers, very little documentation coming from our own people. So we have to navigate around these writings by white people. And what I do is I traverse through, you know, the kind of colonial um, language to find the beauty of us. And sometimes it's tough, and sometimes we do find magic. Like, obviously, this is this was by a woman called Harriet Quimby. So she is, of course, not from the Caribbean. So we're not going to find, like, her speaking about us in a way where in which her own privileges and whiteness does not resonate in the writing. But let us continue. It will take many generations before he loses his childlike and wholly delightful capacity for enjoyment and his love for the weird and half-savage rights of his forefathers. Now, when then people want to talk about savage, I am thinking we're doing some lit thing on the road. We're whining and we're broken out. That's, that's when they say savage. I'm like, yeah, hell yeah. So... 
to the weird and half-savage rites of his forefathers. The islands occupied by the Spanish are no less gay during carnival time, which is celebrated every Sunday during Lent. That's very interesting. Every Sunday during Lent. I thought Lent, you're not supposed to be doing them things. But maybe it's religious based celebrations so it goes on to say but the revels conducted by the spanish are more like those held in nice every year and are composed of beautiful women in fancy costumes men in grotesque disguises and floats some of which are flower trimmed and beautiful and others which are supposed to be comic for the many weeks before carnival is due the quaint little shops in the island seaports are conspicuously displaying toys gay little horns and masks of every description. Every year, the toys become more varied, for this is one thing in which the native merchant keeps strictly up to date. The masks worn by Spanish women are often fascinatingly mysterious. They consist of goggle-like covering for their eyes, from which depends a lace curtain just intricate enough in pattern to show the pretty curve of the mouth without disclosing the identity of the wearer. The masks worn by the colored reveler, especially in Martinique and Dominica, are made of fine white mesh shaped like a face. They are weird and ghost-like. The wire masks are at a premium because of their lightness, the perfect disguise which they furnish, and because of the ease with which their wearer can see through them. Now, some of you guys may recognize that the wire mesh mask of like a white face I've seen that on the shortney in Grenada. I've seen that in some of the Junkanu costumes by the Garifuna people or the Wanagrua. I've seen it with the Wanagrua. I hope I'm pronouncing it correctly. Please, my Belize family, don't kill me. Our Garifuna family, they have these masks, these white wire mesh masks. I've seen them in quite a few masquerade, the fancy clown in Antigua as well. Um, This use of a white wire mesh mask, which is supposed to be mimicking the European colonizer. So this is something you see that has been documented now here also in Martinique and Dominica in 1909. Right? It goes on to say the carnivals held in Santo Domingo and Santiago and Cuba are interesting and sometimes beautiful. But for something quite out of the ordinary, the tourists should attend the carnival in Dominica, which is now the gayest for its size of all the islands. Majority of the survivors of the terrible Martinique disaster when Mount Pele wiped out the most fascinating but most lawless of the West Indian cities. That's interesting that St. Pierre in Martinique was seen as lawless. For those who don't know about the tragedy that happened, this was in 1902 when Pele, the volcano, erupted and 30,000 people um, passed away in that eruption, which happened in a matter of seconds but there were survivors and you know those who lost their homes and so on but basically the whole town was was taken out by the volcano and those who did survive had to go to places like St. Lucia and Dominica and so on. The most fascinating but most lawless of the West Indian cities fled in small boats or were taken by rescuing parties to Dominica where they settled permanently. This accounts for the number of pretty French Creoles seen in the marketplace and on the streets of Roseau. (laughs) Pretty French Creoles. So, you know, there's those kind of sprinkles of colorism and so on in there. So it goes on to say, The utter abandon of the Dominican native is a revelation to the Taurus who has therefore seen only the colored population in our southern states. So clearly this person is American. Um, and she's in Dominica for whatever reason, I guess for carnival time. Well, I don't think she came there for carnival time, but she is a Southern white lady who's come to Dominica and has witnessed carnival. But clearly she has been around the Caribbean a bit for her to make comparisons of carnivals in other countries and saying like, yo, Dominica is the best place. I find that very interesting. So it goes on to say, From all parts of the mountainous little island, the country folk come with fruit and chicken, sometimes gay, to sell in the markets, to swell the spending allowance for confetti. The traveler who spends a day or two in Rosa at this time will be fully repaid for his discomfort in hotel accommodations with a variety of color and sound which meets him at every turn. There is an infection of anticipation in the air, and he will catch it in spite of himself. 
Possibly he will purchase some of the really good candy made of cane syrup and fresh coconut and munch it as he wanders along the narrow cobbled streets enjoying the preliminary dancing and skipping of the children. He will never realize how comely some of the blackest of black native women are until he sees them in holiday attire. Wow. I'm not gonna comment, let's keep it moving. With their brilliant turbans of red and orange and green, or bright purple and orange, blues, blacks, and mauves, mingled together and freshly calendared and tied, their trained dresses of equal brilliance but contrasting color to their turbans, and above all, their flashing eyes and white teeth. I will comment on the white teeth part though, because I find in a lot of the writings, like even from like the 1700s, always oh, say, oh, the Negroes with like their really white teeth. I think there's something to say about <laughs> black people and how we take care of our teeth. So it goes on to say, they form a picture which delights the eye of the artist. Some of the young girls are beautiful in a bronze-like way. And it is a pity that they cover their faces with masks and clothe themselves in costumes other than their own, which suit them so well. Just at sundown and before the native band with this really good music makes an appearance, the masqueraders seem to spring up from earth to form in procession and in twos and threes and groups prance along the sidewalks into the central meeting place. Some of them are costumed like genuine Africans with feather headdresses and bushy hair, hoop earrings, breech cloths, and spear. Others are molasses men. Can we stop right here, right here? Others are molasses men. So we're talking about when you go to carnival and you see people covered in molasses and black oil and we call them jab jab or jab molassi or negosi wo or lanskod right which are all things that we find across the caribbean in haiti in grenada in trinidad across the caribbean and we see it here a hundred plus years ago the molasses men Okay, so understand my Caribbean people, when you're doing these things, just remember these are things your ancestors did, okay? It goes on to say, their bodies are bare, except for a girdle, are covered with molasses, soot, and a few feathers. There are sailors and priests and monks and goblins, all fashioned in primitive native methods. And there are bats, fish, frogs, and devils. The spectators line up along the sidewalk and clap their hands and sing as the drums boom and the procession finally appears around the corner. For 15 or 20 minutes, the main street is filled with prancing, laughing hosts of maskers, some of whom now and then to perform some grotesque dance. <laughs> it was whining. <laughs> which is distinctly African, they was definitely whining, but would nevertheless be recognized in some of the not over modest performances which have been introduced on stages of our theaters during the last year. As the dancers pass, they are covered in confetti. In fact, everyone seems to throw something at somebody else, flowers, sweets, and confetti being the principal objects so carelessly flung at random. After the procession and before and after the dance, which sometimes continues until early morning, there is feasting and a menu containing everything but meats. As in all parts in the West Indies, codfish forms a staple diet of the natives who cook it with oil, rice, tomatoes, and small peppers and serve the mixture with an accompaniment of alligator pears. I feel she means avocado pear because I guess she said the skin... And the outside is like alligator, codfish, saltfish, right? During festival days, a different dish is prepared from the homely cod. Milk is a special luxury in the islands, but during carnival, it is brought into town by the country folk who reap a small harvest from their sails. The dried fish is cut into small pieces and cooked in plain water, served in a milk gravy as it is in the New England states. Hmm, I've never had that, have you? The milkfish is considerably more expensive than the fish in tomato and rice. And this 
possibly has something to do with making it a feast delicacy. So it goes on to say, before the finale of the revel, a mannequin, usually representing some bothersome evil, generally the most unpopular thing in the island life, be it politics or sickness, is burned or flung into the sea with elaborate ceremony. This done, the trouble supposed to have been banished from the island and the merrymakers gradually steal away to their homes, weary but happy. Now, some of my friends from Martinique and Guadeloupe have told me that they do this thing at the end of carnival where they burn this effigy or something. It could be a, a COVID effigy or something that is plaguing the society, be it a sickness or, as it says, a politics or something. And they burn this effigy to say this is going to be the end of this thing. And clearly it was something that was done in Dominica too. So I find this incredibly interesting incredibly incredibly interesting to see so many things that we do today that used to be done over 100 years ago um it fills my heart so this is part one of four of our different versions of carnival how it used to be and that was dominica in 1909 we'll be back right after the break and i'm going to be playing now a bit of traditional quail music from dominica enjoy All right, folks, welcome back. I hope you enjoyed a little piece of music there. And now let's jump into part two of our different viewpoints of carnival over a century ago. So now we're going to head to Martinique, Saint Pierre, Martinique, 1887. The very same Saint Pierre, our homegirl, was talking about um, in the Dominica segment. But this is now. 22 years before she wrote that article and this is now 15 years before the Mount Pele disaster in St. Pierre. Now St. Pierre, I have, you know, in different writings of people speaking about what St. Pierre was like before the volcanic eruption there was beautiful and buzzing and the people were stunning and the way they dressed and the creole head ties and the earrings and the gold chains and how they walked and how they talked and it's just vibrant and amazing and it's like it was the Paris of of the Caribbean it was like so seen described as so beautifully um before so I just found it funny that the lady called it lawless but I don't know maybe gossip was running about things that was going on there and whatever but this is from a book written in 1887 by Lafcadio Hearn and it's called Two Years in the French West Indies. Once again, it's written by a white man. So there's a lot of things that he's writing in there. And it's like, mm, I'm not feeling this. But then there's so much insight. And this is, this is my difficulty when I'm navigating through the stories. But I just have to keep pushing, right? And it does pay off in the end. I, I, I will definitely say that. So this one is speaking about carnival in martinique saint pierre 1887 one returning from the country to the city in carnival season is lucky to find any comfortable rooms for rent i have been happy to secure one even in a rather retired street so steep that it is really dangerous to sneeze while descending it lest one lose one's balance and tumble right across the town it is not a fashionable street but after all there is no particularly fashionable street in this extraordinary city, and the poorer the neighborhood, the better one's chances to see something of its human nature. Hmm, interesting insight. One consolation is that I have Ma Robert for the next door neighbor, who keeps the best bouts in town. Those long, thin Martinique cigars of which a stranger soon becomes fond and who can relate more queer stories and legends of old times in the islands than anyone else I know. Ma Robert, a dealer in such cheap articles of food as the poor live upon, 
fruits and tropical vegetables, manioc flour, called macadam, a singular dish of rice and salt fish, acaras, etc., and her bouts probably bring her the largest profit. They are all brought up by bakeys. So bakeys is the term for white people, white people living in the Caribbean, if it's descendants of slave owners or just white folk, bakey. Um, in St. Lucia, we say bitchy. So these are different variants of the term. So Marube was also a sort of doctor. When anyone in the neighborhood falls sick, she is sent for and very often cures. And she is skilled in the knowledge and use of medicinal herbs, which she gathers herself upon the morns. But these services, she never accepts any remuneration. She is a sort of mother of the poor in immediate vicinity. She helps everybody listens to everybody's troubles. She gives everybody some sort of consolation, trusts everybody and sees a great deal of thankless side of human nature without seeming to feel any worse for it. Poor as she must really be as she appears to have everything that everybody wants and will lend anything to her neighbors except a scissors or a broom, which it is thought bad luck to lend. And finally, if anyone is afraid of being bewitched, Ma Robert can furnish him or her with something that will keep the bewitchment away. Now, I feel like I know people like Ma Robert. Like in every Caribbean community, there is a woman like this who, she's like a hustler. Like she does like sell everything. She can cook anything. A healer as well. And someone who supports those and doesn't ask for money back. I think that there is a Ma Robert in every Caribbean community. Do you know one? So it goes on to say, February 15th, Ash Wednesday. The last masquerade will appear this afternoon. Notwithstanding, for the carnival in Martinique is a day longer than elsewhere. All through the country districts since the first week of January, there have been wild festivities every Sunday. Dancing on the public highways to the patterning of tom-toms, the African dancing to which is never seen in St. Pierre. That is very interesting. Never seen in St. Pierre. Okay. In the city, however, there has been less merriment than in previous years. The natural gaiety of the population has been visibly affected by the advent of a terrible and unfamiliar visit to the island, La Verette. She came by the steamer from Cologne. It was in September. Only two cases had been reported when every neighboring British colony quarantined against Martinique. When other West Indian colonies did likewise, only two cases of smallpox. Okay, so I guess La Verette is smallpox. But there may be 2,000 in another month, answered the governors and the consuls to the many indignant protests. Amongst the West Indian populations, it means the exterminating plague. Two months later, the little capital of Fort de France was swept by the pestilence as by a wind of death. As the evil began to spread, it entered St. Pierre in December, by Christmas last time. Last week, 173 cases were reported and a serious epidemic was almost certain. There are only 8,500 inhabitants in Fort de France and there are 28,000 in the three quarters of St. Pierre proper not including her suburbs, and there is no saying what ravages the disease may take there. Three o'clock, hot and clear. In the distance, there is a heavy sound of drums, always drawing near. Tom, 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 Tom. The grand rue is lined with expectant multitudes. Oti maskla. Where are the maskers? It is little Mimi's voice, quite anxious as she is to know where the maskers are. Come and see, come and see. The drums are drawing clear, the children cry. Everyone is running to the grand room. Tom, 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 Tom. The spectacle is interesting from the battery. High up the rupee set, up all the precipitous streets that ascend to the morns, far gathering showy color appears. The massing of maskers in rose and blue and sulfur yellow attire. And then what a day gringo lad begins and oi! Y'all see what's going on there? For those who know about the word dingole, and we were saying that the word dingole comes from the French word de gingole. Oh my gosh, there we go, right there, which means to tumble. And he goes on to say it right here. I'm just gonna throw in a clip of the iconic Calypso song dingole. 
just to jog your memory because there we go. So when we say Dingo Lane, this is something that we have been using from like the 1800s. Everybody put Dingo Lane, Dingo Lane. What a tumbling, leaping, cascading of color as the troops descend simultaneously from north and south, from the moulage to the fort, two immense bands enter the grand room. The great dancing societies, they are two rivals. They are composers and singers of those carnival songs, cruel satires most often, of which the local meaning is unintelligible to those unacquainted with the incident inspiring the improvisation. And this is very much what the heart of like Calypso music is and carnival music because carnival music is social and political commentary. And this is why it's so important to me for us to encourage the use of carnival music in carnival because this is what our heritage is. The use of these carnival songs that speak out about social injustices, political injustices, or speaking about carnival in particular in the lyrics. And this is what we see here in this example from 1887 in Martinique. So it goes on to say, of which the words are often too coarse or obscene, whose burdens will be caught up and re-echoed through the birds of the island. Vile as may be the motive, the satire, the malice, these chants are preserved for generations by the singular beauty of the airs. And a victim of a carnival song, need never hope that his failing or his wrong will be forgotten. It will be sung long after he's in his grave. And these are one of the things that inspire me so much about Carnival. It is a moment for the people to have a voice against those who have done injustice to the society. Carnival is a time where in which the people have a voice, a collective voice to speak out against injustices and to really point a finger at a specific person and call their name, chant their name, make fun of them, you know, and making people be accountable for their BS. And this is why Carnival is so powerful. Anyways, I'm going to go and it says, 10 minutes more and the entire length of the street is thronged with a shouting, shrieking, laughing, gesticulating host of maskers. Thicker and thicker the press becomes. The drums are silent. All are waiting for the signal of the general dance. Jests and practical jokes are being everywhere perpetuated. And there is a vast hubbub made up of screams, cries, chattering and laughter. Here and there, snatches of carnival songs are being sung. Tea from la do, li do, li do. Sweeter than syrup the little woman is. The burden will be remembered when the rest of the song passes out of fashion. Brown hands reach out from the crowd of masks, pulling on the beards and patting the faces of white spectators. So it says, I know you, I know you, I know you, do do, darling. And it goes on to say, give me a half franc. It is well to refuse a half franc, though you do not know how these maskers might take a notion to do today. Then all the great drums suddenly boom together and all the bands strike up. A mad medley kaleidoscopes into some sort of order and the immense processional dance begins. From the moulage to the fort, there is but one continuous torrent of sound and color. You are dazed by the tossing of peaked caps and waving of hands and twinkling of feet. And all this passes with a huge swing, a regular swing left to right. It would take at least an hour for all to pass. And it is an hour well worth passing. Band after band whirls by. The musicians all garbed as women or as monks in canary colored habits. Before them, the dancers are dancing backward with the motion of the skaters. Behind them all leap and wave in hands in pursuit. Most of the bands are playing Creole airs, but that of the Sanssouci, which is one of the names of the bands, strikes up a melody of the latest French song in vogue, Petit Amoureux aux Plumes, Little Feathered Lovers. Everybody now seems to know this song by heart. 
You can hear children only five or six years old singing it. There are pretty lines in it, although two out of its four stanzas are commonplace enough, and it is certainly the air rather than the words which accounts for its sudden popularity. Extraordinary things are happening in the streets through this which the procession passes. Pest smitten women rise from their beds to costume themselves, to mask a face already made unrecognizable by the hideous malady. I'm assuming he's talking about the smallpox and stagger out to join the dancers. And it is in the Rue Saint Marthe that there are three young girls sick with the disease, who hear the blowing of the horns and the pattering of feet and the clapping of hands in chorus. And they get up and look through the slats of the windows on the masquerade and the creole passion of the dance that comes upon them. Ah, cries one, we have our fill of fun. Says our fair see no more. What matter if we die after? And I thought this moment really powerful because, you know, they're sick with smallpox, which is, at the time, was a very fatal disease. And, you know, having carnival fill their hearts to the point where they say, we have our fill of fun. What matter if we die after? And I think that was one of the most powerful things I've ever read. Um, and I, I feel that way about Carnival. I think any one of us who've really been a part of Carnival and celebrated it, there is a moment where you are at your peak and where nothing else matters. And Carnival is very much that. And to have these women who knows what happened to them after. And that's what they said, that no matter if we die after, and this is why I find it so hurtful when people reduce carnival to just a street party. You know, it is way, way, way more than that. It is something that is so spiritual and powerful. And I'd like, you know, the public to really come to recognize that it's not just a cheap free party, an excuse to get wasted. It really and truly is a legacy of our ancestors and we should really really honor that it goes on to say and all mask and join the roots and dance down the savan the costumes are rather disappointing now i i'm vex i'm vex because what do you mean the costumes are disappointing maybe he doesn't know what they mean what they signify it's not all about beauty right it's not all about the pretty pageantry through the mummery has some general characteristics which are not unpicturesque. For example, the predominance of crimson and canary yellow in choice of color and a marked predilection for the pointed hoods and high-peaked headdresses. Mock religious costumes also form a striking element in the general tone of the display. There are no historical costumes, a few eccentricities or monsters, only a few vampire bat headdresses abruptly break the effect of the peaked caps and the hoods. There are some delicately local ideas in dress which deserve notice. The Congo, the baby, or the Timamai. Timamai means baby or child, right? And the Ti Nego Siwo, the little molasses negro, and the Chabless. Right? So, let's take a moment here. So, the Congo, I believe, is a style of costume that is still played in Martinique Carnival. Maybe Guadeloupe, my family in Guadeloupe and Martinique, let me know, where they recreate themselves as an image of their African ancestor using um, different natural materials and so on. But it has a very specific look and I believe that is the Congo. The baby or the Timamai. Now, this is, there's something called a baby doll in Trinidad. So this is, I'm wondering, is it that? Because where it is, you'd find grown women dressed as baby dolls. So what is that? The Tinegusiu, so which is the little molasses negro. So we see that in Dominica had it, the molasses men, she called it. And Negusiu is something that is still, the term is still used today in Martinique and Guadeloupe. And it's something that still happens today. And there was a record from 1848 in Trinidad speaking about the same thing. And I'm paraphrasing, but it was saying something like a gang of naked primitives 
bedaubed in black varnish. I'm pulling chains. So there we go. Going all the way back to 1848 in Trinidad. So this is something that has been happening in the Caribbean for at least 200 years, I'd say. Okay, so I'm like, legacy, legacy, legacy. And then the jobless. The jobless, well, what we call is la jobless, right? So la jobless, for what I know growing up in St. Lucia, is basically the she-devil. And she's a spirit who has a long dress and she has a cow hoof. Now, she's called something else in other countries. Because I know my family, when I say family, I'm talking about people I know. And those who support the Instagram page, because, you know, the whole purpose of Know Your Caribbean is about the Caribbean family reconnecting and having these conversations online. And I very much feel like we have a family community. So when I say family, I'm speaking about like the Know Your Caribbean family. There are other names for this character. She has a cow hoof. She hides a cow hoof with her long dress. And she seduces men into the forest or in secluded areas and seduces him and she steals his spirit. But we can see here the larger bless was something that was around in Martinique in 1887. He goes on to add some more description. The Congo is merely the exact reproduction of dress worn by workers on the plantations. For the women, a grey calico shirt and coarse petticoat of porcelain with two coarse handkerchiefs, one for the neck and one for the head, over which is worn a monstrous straw hat. She walks either barefoot or short with rude native sandals, and she carries a hoe. For the man, the costume consists of a grey shirt, blue canvas pantaloons, a large mouchoir fata to tie around his waist, and a chapeau bakoué an enormous hat of Martinique palm straw. He walks around barefooted and carries a cutlass. The sight of the troop of the young girls are baby in baby dress. There we go. It's really pretty. This costume comprises only of a loose embroidered chemise, lace edged pantalets and a child's cap. The whole being brightly decorated with bright ribbons of various colors. The dress is short and leaves much of the lower limbs exposed. And there is ample opportunity for display of tinted stockings and elegant slippers. Kind of sounds like the baby doll we see in Trinidad. The molasses negro wears nothing but a cloth around his loins. His whole body and face being smeared with an atrocious mixture of soot and molasses. He is supposed to represent the original African ancestor. There you go. So all them things, jab, jab, negoci, wo, jab, molasi, all of that is, you know, as I say, legacy. The devil-less or the larger bless are few in number, but it requires a very tall woman to play the devil-less. She is robed in all black with a white turban and a white fouillard. They wear all black masks. They also carry bombs. So BOMS bones, which are large tin cans, which they allow to fall upon the pavement, and from time to time they walk barefoot. The devil's represents a singular Martinique superstition. It is said that sometimes at noonday, a beautiful negress passes silently through some isolated plantation, smiling at the workers in the cane fields, tempting men to follow her. But he who follows her never comes back again. And when the field had mysteriously disappears, his fellows say he went to the larger bless. The tallest among the devilesses always walks first, chanting the question, Is it yet daybreak? And for the others to reply in chorus, It is not yet day. The masks worn by a multitude include very few grotesques. As a rule, they are simply white wire masks. You see the same thing? Same thing that we saw in Dominica. White wire masks. Okay? And I know they have them in so many versions of traditional masks. I think in St. Kitts and Nevis as well. I have seen them in the Gombe in Bermuda as well. Anyways, let's continue, right? So, the white wire mask, having the form of an oval and regular human face and disguise a wearer absolutely. It struck me that this peculiar type of wire mask gave me an indescribable tone of ghostliness to the whole exhibition. 
It is not in the least comical. It is neither comely or ugly. It is colorless as mist, expressionless and void. It lies on the face like a vapor, like a cloud, creating the idea of a spectral vacuity behind it. Oh, damn. Yeah, but I mean, that's what I think that was the intention of the masks, actually. It's not meant to be necessarily funny or beautiful, but as he says, expressionless and void. So there's a kind of somberness to it in a way, but not literal somberness. It's almost like, to me, it's, it's just like a reflection of the feeling of, of colonialism, which is a void. You know, it's expressionless and void. There's so much trauma and pain it's intermixed into one thing. That's how I feel about it. Please give me some feedback. Let me hear from you guys what you all think. So he says, here comes a band, the second band that is fighting the Sans Souci, right? And they call it Intrepids. Playing the Buene. B-O-U-E-N-E, the Buene. It is a dance melody. It is also a mode of dancing, peculiar and unrestrained. The dancers advance and retreat face to face and they hug each other, press together and separate to embrace again. A very old dance, this, of African origin, perhaps. Perhaps the same of which Pela Bat wrote in 1722. You all have heard Pela Bat so many times. This is your first time listening. Pela Bat was a priest in Martinique and Guadeloupe. He was a slave owning priest, apparently racist, but he wrote a lot. And documented a lot. So he is a great resource, but a very racist one. So here's what Pelabat says about this dance. It is not modest. Nevertheless, it has not failed to become so popular with the Spanish Creoles of America. So much in vogue among them. I didn't even know in vogue was something that people wrote in 1722. But I'm, I'm learning. That it now forms the chief of their amusements and that it enters even into their devotions. They dance it even in their churches, in their processions, and the nuns seldom fail to dance it at Christmas night. Mm, very intermixing of African and Christian beliefs in one into a dance. There we go. So the writing goes on to say, every year on the last day of carnival, a droll ceremony used to take place called the burial of the Bois Bois. The Bois Bois being a dummy, a guy, caricaturing the most unpopular thing in city life or in politics. So you see, it's the same thing like we saw in Dominica. The burning of this, having this effigy and burning, right? This Bois Bois, having been paraded with mock solemnity, so the ways of St. Pierre is either interred or drowned, flung into the sea. And yesterday, the dancing societies had announced their intention to bury Bois Bois La Verette a mannequin that was to represent the plague. But the Boaba does not make its appearance. La Verette is too terrible a visitor to be made fun of, my friends. You will not laugh at her because you dare not. And a multicolored clamoring stream rushes by. All of a sudden there is a hush, a halt. The drums stop beating, the song cease, then I see a sudden scattering of goblins, demons, and devilesses in all directions. They run into houses, up alleys, behind doorways, and the crowd parts. Straight through it, walking very quickly, comes a priest in his vestments, preceded by an acolyte who rings a little bell. Say, Bordier Capasse. It is the good God who goes by. The father is bearing a viacatum to some victim of the pestilence. One must not appear masked as a devil or devilless in the presence of the body. Good God. He goes by. The flood of maskers recloses behind the ominous passage. The drums boom again. The dance recommences. And all the fantastic mummery ebbs swiftly out of sight. So, folks, that is our excerpt um, from Carnival in Martinique in 1887. As we can see, a lot of synergies between Carnival in Martinique and in Dominica. And I just love finding these old traditions that we have kept alive today. Folks, let's work 
work, work, work to keep these traditions alive. Let's not let them die. Yeah, so we're going to move on. going to have a little break. Let me see if I can get some Martinic music to play for you all a little something. And um, when we come back, we are jumping into Puerto Rico, folks. What was kind of like in Puerto Rico? Right, folks, let me dive into this thing one time, one cut, no long thing, right? It's February 26, 1903, and we are in Puerto Rico, folks. And this article is also in the Frank Leslie's Weekly, and it's written by Adam C. Hasselbarth, and it's called Curious Carnival Customs in Puerto Rico. Now, I don't think I know enough about carnival in puerto rico i know they have their own versions of a devil and also the dominican republic also has a version of a devil but it's very different to the job or the devil that you see um say like in trinidad or grenada and them kind of sides it's it's like the costumes are very very elaborate now they have trinidad has a different version of job so job which means devil which are the whip masters and they have very elaborate costumes but it's still very different to the ones that you see in places like puerto rico and the dominican republic so we're gonna jump right in so this is 1903 so this is like almost 120 years ago never seen before has san juan made such elaborate preparations for the celebration of the annual carnival and mardi gras day this year americans are uniting with puerto ricans costume makers are busy Ball committees are getting together and a local paper is conducting a voting contest to choose two queens, one American and the other Puerto Rican. This will be crowned on the night of Shrove Tuesday, February 24th, at the Ball of San Juan Fraternity. It is a contest of the American girls which is led by Miss Hunt, the governor's daughter. The carnival begins with special services in all the Catholic churches on Sunday. The merriment will then reign supreme for 10 days and nights during which the time business will be practically at a standstill. Everyone is good natured and would suffer if you were not. There are brilliant fireworks galore at these carnivals and bombs that sound as loud as did Samson's shells when they broke over the city. Masking is freely permitted and costumes of all sorts and descriptions, cheap and costly, are seen in the streets. To the Puerto Rican children and to many of the grown-ups, it is like a foretaste of heaven. The boys go out in droves, shouting their vivas as vigorously for a hideous devil as they would for a fairy, an ox, a pig or a giant. And no boys on earth can make more noise than those of the Latin race. <laughs> Okay. Apart from the masking and general joyous caressing of the features, there are decorations, the coach parades, the balls, or bailes in the theater, the universal use of confetti, or papeleta, or papillos. The former is merely tiny discs of bright paper, which everyone throws at everyone's neighbor. The latter is colored paper tape, which is hurled across streets from balcony to balcony, soon creating a rainbow tinted net. That is more complicated than the tangled web we weave when we first practice to deceive. As it requires a good eye, a strong arm, and an erring aim to land these rules in the right place, they often fall short and trail down the streets, giving a very pretty effect. The sidewalks, plazas, and streets soon become covered with confetti so that one walks on a carpet of color. The urchins profit by the waste and scoop it up, dirt and all, to throw it at unwary pedestrians. The effect on this on white clothes is particularly distressing. 
Confetti stands are erected all over the city, the bits of paper being sold by the pound or in little bags to the children at a penny a bag. All classes of dealers become temporary carnival merchants for the sale of masks, dominoes, ready-made costumes, fireworks, horns, flower, perfumery, squirt guns, and other carnival goods. It is considered a proper carnival diversion to squirt perfume on the ladies, they being privileged to retaliate or to throw flower. That's quite cool, you know. I mean, could you imagine? It sounds so colorful, like confetti everywhere. And like whatever paper um, streamers everywhere and it's like the smell of perfume and then you see all these like bursts of flower you know it's really really quite different so it goes on to sing a favorite amusement is to drop on the head a passerby a bag of flour from a balcony i don't know if that could cause war if some people you know if i'm walking on the street with my banging carnival outfits but it depends if you go i guess people go prepared to get dusted over by flour the rougher sports follow this bag of flour with one filled with water. Jeez. Covering the luckless victim for fair grade of paste. Nah, I, I don't know about that one, eh? And I mean, I get dirty for, for like dirty mass and thing, like paint, powder, oil, chocolate, all things, but I don't know about that sticky dough, boy. I don't know. Yet with all the capers, liberty seldom denigrates into license and the limits of proper consideration for the rights and feelings of others are quite carefully observed okay fair enough the celebration throughout is typically spanish and every red and yellow banner on the island is flung into the breeze even the mingling of the stars and stripes does not remove the impression that the spectators in a spanish city the celebration is general throughout puerto rico its magnitude depending on the size of the town Two of the most striking features of carnival are the coach parade and the balls. The parade goes over a line of march three miles long to Santusi, and it appears every vehicle that can be bought into requisition. These are filled with merrymakers, mostly masked, and are decorated with real and artificial flowers, palms, tinsel, and flags. In San Juan, the balls are held in a big theater owned by the city. They are the red, white, and blue balls the children's ball and the fancy dress ball. At the first three, there is a strict observance of color schemes. For instance, at the red ball, the dancers must wear only red and only red confetti will be thrown. That sounds really stunning. Really, really, really stunning. Can you imagine like everyone is in red and the red confetti falling in this beautiful ballroom? It sounds absolutely stunning. And imagine it in all blue and in all white. The decorations of the theater are also red. At the blue ball, everything is blue. And at the white, white prevails. The children's ball brings together some of the most beautiful children on earth. Many of them in lavish and costly costumes, historical accuracy being often observed. The children's ballet is worth going a long distance to see. At the great fancy dress ball, which closes the carnival, the fun is fast and furious. And at this ball, more Americans participate than any other. No one is admitted to the floor unless masked, and surprises are many when the dominoes are removed at night. This year, the presence of 200 businessmen of New Orleans on a trade excursion to San Juan will add to the gaiety, and their experiences in their home city will be valuable to the committee having carnival affairs in charge. So this write-up, is much shorter than the others about kind of in Puerto Rico, but I, it could be from the perspective of this person, the experience of this person, but I'm not getting a feel of African influences. It sounds more of like a European Spanish themed carnival where it's more elaborate costumes um, and then masking and having things inside interior spaces so balls and theater rooms which sound stunning but very different to like a carnival parade parade per se but it could have been this man's experience because i don't think all carnival celebrations in in puerto rico are like this but i think it was his specific one but it's intriguing the use of flower and then also the use of like spraying women to perfume and things like that i think it is really quite a sensory overload. If you're going there with that expectation to have all of this, these smells and 
textures and colors. And it's one thing about having like a mixture of like a million colors, but there's also a power in having a singular color as well, where everything is just that one color. I think that's really powerful. So, folks, that was Carnival in Puerto Rico in 1903. So up next, after a very short musical break, we are going to have Carnival in Havana, Cuba. What was that like? And for this musical interlude, we're going to have some traditional plena music from Puerto Rico. Plena music exists from Afro-Puerto Rican resistance, the insistence of using the drum even when it was illegal, to the point that they created a different type of drum to keep the rhythm alive. So here we go, some traditional plena music from Puerto Rico. Welcome back, folks, to this carnival session. Four different perspectives of carnival from four different countries. And now we're at country number four. We are going to Cuba. And now we're in Cuba, 1899 Cuba. And this is again from the Frank Wesley's weekly newspaper, which seems to be an American publication. And the title of this one is While the Poor Are Starving, the Rich Waste Wealth in Carnival's Folly. People given up to the theaters and ballrooms, curious customs, generous hospitality to the Americans. So it says, Havana, March 10th, 1899. While the poor are dying of starvation, a carnival goes on. And every Sunday, the maskers throw enough flour at each other to feed the poor for days. So as we can see here, another synergy between Puerto Rico and Cuban carnival with the throwing of flour. The carnival lasts a couple of weeks, but only on a Sunday it is in full swing, and the maskers on foot and in carriages crowd the principal promenade. Were it controlled to a degree of decency, it would be a pretty affair, but not content with throwing flowers and confetti. The people make little balls of flour and limestone ground into powder and pelt everyone who crosses their path. Those who throw the stuff come prepared, covered with a domino or cloak to keep themselves clean. To be struck with one of these missiles means ruination to any clothes. Those who throw flour ride about in open carriages at a fast gait and pelt whomever they can, particularly well-dressed persons who are not masked or participating in the festivities. Horsed men ride at a breakneck speed and carriages at a run totally unmindful of the danger incurred. One party of about 10 had one of the city fire patrols out to use as a conveyance. They were all masked and covered with dominoes. They were throwing at everyone who came in range. From the balconies and from the streets, they were pelted in return. And late into the afternoon, those in the balconies brought buckets of water to throw on the maskers and others already covered in flour. This is an interesting dynamic. I'm trying to break it down because it seems like those who are throwing flour at the well-dressed, I would have said is some form of resistance in terms of just the spirit of carnival within the Caribbean is very anti-colonial it's, it's anti-class it is speaking up against you know the wealthy and you know the lawmakers but this person is saying that whilst the poor are starving people are just throwing flour so i'm trying to decide who are the flower throwers you know what kind of demographic do they come from but let's carry on and let's try and see if you can figure it out the result can be imagined and the pleasure of utterly ruining someone's clothes seems to please many to escape the return of fireballs, of flour, and of water, the carriages drive at a terrific pace, causing many accidents. 
The fire patrol raced up and down the driveway, striking several carriages and running over a small boy who was carried off apparently lifeless. This sounds like absolute chaos. I am trying to wrap my head. I don't know if the person is coming from a very negative space, a very conservative background, but it sounds extremely chaotic and not like a joyful exchange, like how, for example, it seemed the one in Puerto Rico felt more playful, although it annoyed some, but still had a very playful feel. This one seems to be a very unbalanced kind of carnival, but it could be from this person's perspective, right? But the fact that if someone, if a, a little boy lost his life and things carried on, because they go on to say, but they did not even slacken their speed. And finally, when the driver was arrested for reckless driving, and while the accident could be investigated, it turned out that the maskers on patrol who caused the trouble included the chief of police, Cuban General Mendocal, Cuban General Sanguli, and others of the local prominence. Who should be the ones to prevent rather than create disturbances? When they were cited to appear as witnesses, they were immensely indignant that they should be called to account and declared that they were Cuban officers and they should be allowed to do as they wished. Hmm. This is interesting because in terms of the police caused this riot, the police being the instigators of problems in the carnival. Normally the police are the ones causing problems by fighting the masqueraders. And now the police are the masqueraders causing trouble, including the chief of police. I have never seen something like this before. You know, speaking about this specific person, is that the spirit of carnival or is that the spirit of these specific people? I cannot say. So let's go on. Except for the Sunday, street masking and throwing flowers, etc. The carnival consists principally of balls. Every night there are club balls, private balls, and public balls. And during the carnival, they are all mask affairs, and many of them very pretty gatherings. At the various theaters, balls are held. All playhouses having floors that can be raised to a level with a stage. When the seats are cleared away, there is a splendid space given to the dancers. Cuban dance is a peculiar one when viewed through the American eyes, for it is so totally different from any of our dances. There is only one step, and that one is a sort of a mixture of Indian, Turkish, and Chinese. Two orchestras play continuously, one taking up the music as the other ceases. The music almost identical with some that I have heard at the dances of our Indian tribes in Arizona and New Mexico except that there is a continual blare of the cornet. They use tom-toms, kettle drums, and some weird godlike affair that they beat most vigorously, emitting a sound quite musical as a boy would make with a barrel stave as he ran along a picket fence. So within that, I'm, I'm picking up to me some kind of African kind of vibe, even though there's no mention of that in terms of like the ferocity of the drum that she's talking about. Havana is the same lively place day and night, and were it not for the order that has been issued compelling cafes to close their bars by one o'clock, I do not think the crowd would go home at all. The Havana theater audience are, as a whole, as pretty and bright as any I ever saw. The women are strikingly beautiful or painfully homely. The balconies and the lower circle of the theatres are built into boxes and on gala night. When they are filled, the house is ablaze with some brilliant costumes and pretty effects of dress, both in men and women. Such it is only possible to obtain in the tropical capital. It's very interesting about the throwing of the flower which you found in Puerto Rico and in Cuba, which are the Spanish-speaking Caribbean islands. And, you know, just doing some very quick research, I can see that they have flower-throwing festivals in Spain. So this could be something that was brought down to the Caribbean through European uh, Spanish influence. And it was incorporated into carnival because the flower throwing does not happen for the carnival period in Spain. But I think it was something that was just incorporated into the merriment. But yeah, very four different perspectives, different synergies. I think I love finding our traditions that stayed alive. 
And, you know, looking at, in particular, the documentation in Martinique in terms of the use of the songs. Now, obviously, this is not Calypso music per se. And one of the things is that when we look at the representations of Carnival, it is within the Caribbean, it's very much a focus on Trinidad, which Trinidad's history of Carnival is extremely powerful and is deserving of its episode in its entirety by itself. But also looking at Carnival within the French-speaking, Dutch-speaking, and Spanish-speaking Caribbean, and how in which it's developed and has so many similarities of political and social resistance, and then also the preservation of our African heritage. So if we're talking about Pella Bad, who's talking about this dance that was done in 1722, and then they're still doing it 160-something years later, and that we're still doing it today, this is now 300 years later. If Pella Bad wrote something in 1722, we are now in 2022, 300 years of doing this dance and cultural preservation through carnival. Carnival is so powerful, and this is why we must preserve our carnival traditions. Because when we walk these steps in carnival, we are walking the walks of our ancestors. We are dancing the dances of our ancestors. We are singing the songs of our ancestors. We are upholding and honoring the things that they did. And they did so in a very different space to what we have. We now have a privileged space and so much more freedom than they did. And they did that shit anyway. Knowing that there could be repercussions, they did that shit anyway. And now we are in privileged spaces and we're happy to just erase it and say this old time thing and not bother with it. That's a complete disrespect to the legacy of resistance that our ancestors did and use carnival as a pathway of resistance and cultural retention of our African heritage, our Indian heritage, our Amerindian indigenous heritage. We have to uphold these traditions. Remember always, I am because they were. We are because they were. Ferme-moi et dis-moi des mots doux. 